Hi, I'm Sonja Englert. Welcome to my airplane design video number 16. The last tutorial was about flutter and ground vibration tests. In this one we will get back to the airplane design process and the new topic is airplane loads. By now the airplane geometry has to be fully defined with all dimensions, weights and performance expectations. Before we can design and analyze the aircraft structure we need to have loads that we can use to size the structure. Coming up with good loads is pretty important. If we get this wrong, the airplane might end up being too weak to withstand all the flight loads that are encountered during its life and break apart at an inconvenient moment. Developing the best loads has been an ongoing process since airplanes were invented. If the load assumptions are too low, too many airframes will fail. If they are too high, the airplanes end up being too heavy and perform poorly. Fortunately, by now there are some very detailed instructions available on how to go about it. They can be found in the aircraft certification rules, for example 14 CFR part 23 in the section of load on loads. This is available on the FAA website for free. They are the result of experiences of what worked and what didn't. So all we really need to do is read those instructions and use them. The loads that are des described in the regulations are limit loads. This means airplanes designed accordingly can be operated up to these loads without damage. Ultimate loads are limit load times the factor of 1.5. When you exceed ultimate loads, the airplane is allowed to break. Even if you exceed limit loads, the airframe may get damaged, but it should not fail in a way that would cause it to crash. We have already defined the weight and CG envelope for the airplane. Now we need to define another envelope, the speed load factor envelope. Here are the corner points for the pilot maneuvering loads in black, defined by speed starting at the stall speed, up to VD, the maximum design speed. For each speed, the airplane may be subjected up to a certain G load. Up to VA, it is the maximum that is aerodynamically possible then a limit is selected. The typical limits are for example 3.8 G for normal category, 4.4 G for utility category and 6 G for aerobatic category. A similar envelope is defined for gust loads here in red which are loads inflicted upon the airplane when it flies through severe turbulence. The regulations also have requirements for the minimum design airspeeds, such as VC, VD and VA for example. These speeds are based on the wing loading, stall speed and the maneuvering load factor. Using the formula shown in this example ensures that the speed limits are appropriate to the airplane design. The formulas shown are for the normal category. The minimum speeds for other categories may be different. Of course, you can also select higher limits than the minimums. For the design of the structure, we need to find the load cases that pr produce the highest loads. This means calculating the loads for every weight and CG combination with flaps up and down for the minimum and maximum altitude for the corner points of the speed load factor envelopes, then comparing them and selecting the worst cases. The number of load cases can run into the hundreds for a complex airplane, so this is best done with a program. Let's say we have found the load cases that for example produce the highest wing loads, which may be different cases for each wing bending and torsion. We can use the high G pull up at maximum weight as an example. The lift is the positive force in the up or Z direction, while the drag acts backwards in the X direction. For a simple analysis, we divide the wing into small sections, for example 15 sections over the span per side, and calculate the lift, drag and torsion for each section. The goal is to sum this up into shear force, bending moment and twisting moment distributions over the span. This chart shows the results. As you can see, the loads are the highest in the center. The key is to get the lift distribution right or at least conservative. If you remember, we looked at this in the tutorial about the wing planform. The influence of aileron deflections must also be considered 
because a down deflection increases the lift on the outboard wing and therefore the bending moment. There are different procedures for coming up with loads depending on which part of the airplane we are investigating. The fuselage loads are calculated a bit differently from what I have explained so far. The fuselage is also divided into sections, but here it is not the lift that creates the highest loads, but the mass. The lift from the fuselage can be neglected, but the horizontal tail lift is considered. Now we need the fuselage mass distribution that we came up with in the fuselage design tutorial. In combination with the load factor, each item creates a downforce during the high G pull-up. This is opposed by the lift from the wing. In front of and aft of the wing, the fuselage is bent down, which is shown here as a negative moment MY. In addition to the loads from masses, the fuselage also s has to support the tail loads. During the pull-up, the horizontal tail produces a downforce. Because it is out there on the tail arm, it increases the fuselage bending moment. A rudder deflection creates a side force and bends the fuselage to the side. The fuselage loads are divided into balanced and unbalanced loads. A balanced flight condition is one where example the airplane flies a steady arc during the pull-up with a constant load factor. The aerodynamic forces are balanced by inertia loads. Unbalanced loads are the result, for example a sudden elevator input. How the shear force distributions compare to the balanced condition is shown in this chart. The airplane reacts by pitching up, but the pitch rate is not constant but accelerating. In contrast, during the balanced maneuver, the tail needs to create only enough force to achieve a certain constant pitch rate and maneuvering load factor. An unbalanced tail load can be much higher than a balanced tail load because the tail may reach its aerodynamic limit. So the unbalanced fuselage loads are likely higher than the balanced ones. The horizontal and vertical tail loads can be calculated in a similar way as the wing loads, from the aerodynamic forces those surfaces are capable of generating. The balanced horizontal tail loads are calculated from the airplane pitching moment requirements of the various load cases at the corner points of the speed load factor diagrams. The unbalanced tail loads are simply the tail area times the dynamic pressure at VA times the maximum lift coefficient. For calculating the control surface loads, the FAR 23 regulations offer simplified methods if the airplane is of a conventional configuration and meet certain criteria. These are the Appendix A loads. The load distributions for flaps and control surfaces are here assumed to be of rectangular or triangular shape. The size is selected to be conservative which means these assumptions re result in potentially higher than reality loads, but it makes the analysis very simple. You don't need to use the Appendix A methods if you have ways to calculate the loads more realistically. I will use the flaps as an example of what Appendix A loads look like. The cordwise flap load distribution is a rectangle of the height of 2 times W from the hinge forward to the leading edge. Aft of the hinge, it tapers off to the height of W at the trailing edge. W is the average surface loading, which is proportional to the maximum wing loading of the airplane and the maximum maneuvering load factor. The loading over the span of the flap is shown in this sketch. The spanwise load is proportional to the flap cord. Summing it up gives you the total flap load for, for the use in the structural analysis or load test. These are the main loads. There are other loads, such as engine mount loads, that I have mentioned in the video about engine installations, control system loads and landing gear loads, for example. Again, using the regulations even for experimental airplanes, allows us to make use of the experience that has gone into coming up with these requirements. If it worked for other airplanes in real life for thousands of flight hours, it should work for the new airplane too. Airframe failures of aircraft that have been designed to these loads are rare. If something does break, it is mostly because the limitations of the airplane were exceeded. 
for example by flying it at weights higher than gross weight. With this I want to conclude my overview of the loads analysis process. I will go into a few basics about structural design and analysis in the next video.